Welcome everyone. I'm just waiting for some people to join us here. Feel free to participate in our poll. Let us know where you're from. If uh, you're not from anywhere located in the uh, in the options, let us know in the chat. Are you saying if they're homeless? Is that... No, no, no. I'm saying if there are uh, anywhere outside of uh, basically North America. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, it looks the nice thing. Looks like we've got uh, once again coast to coast, including someone from the territories. We don't see too many people from the territories, so that's great uh, to have someone from there. All right, so uh, looks like most people have responded so far. So I will go ahead and share those. Most people are from Ontario uh, with the nice representation from coastal uh, provinces. We've got some from the Atlantic provinces and, the, and uh, BC, as well as uh, some of the prairies. And from the territories, in the territories, let us know where you're from. All right, uh, one more poll. We wanna know what occupation that you're in. So why don't you just uh, take a moment to answer that. And if uh, your uh, career path is not listed there in the, in the other, please let us know in the chat. Let us know what you do. So, oh, this is fantastic. So, Gord, it looks like we have, again, everybody from all uh, categories, from builders to renovators, construction trades, uh, government at all three levels, architects, engineers, the utilities, and academia. And let's see who's in the chat, uh, energy evaluator and a student. Excellent. Cool. Okay, so I will just um, share that so you can get a a feel for that, mainly yeah, engineers and architects. So that's great. So welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Coleman. I'm marketing and business development manager with Building Knowledge Canada. So welcome to the Enbridge uh, and Building Knowledge Advanced Building Science webinar series, which is a monthly event. And um, so today, Gord and Rob are going to be speaking about large building air tightness. Now, Susan Cudahy was unable to join us today, but she wanted to send her uh, regards. Uh, she is from Enbridge, and as mentioned, they are the sponsors for today's webinar. Just a little bit of uh, Zoom housekeeping. Uh, as we go through, if you have any questions for uh, Gord or Rob, please use the question and answer function. And uh, what we'll do is every now and again, we'll just pipe in and uh, I'll, I'll interrupt and, uh, and we'll ask the questions as we go along. And if you have just general comments, that sort of thing, please feel free to use the chat and, uh, and, and we will engage with you that way. Same thing if you have any sort of technical issues, just put it in the chat or email me and I'll be, uh, I'll be monitoring that. So, um, so Gord and Rob, I will go ahead and hand things over to you and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. And I'll share my screen if that's okay, Steph. Yes, you may. And um, what are we saying? I see it up, Gordon. Yeah, Great. it looks like you're in presenter mode. You're good. Great. Um, well, thanks, folks, uh, for joining us. And I always I'll say on behalf of Susan Cuddy and, and Stephanie, I still think it's very cool that Enbridge uh, sponsors these kinds of sessions. You know, they're your partner in um, energy services or energy uh, uh, elements and yet here they are trying to promote the idea of using less of their product. I think it's an interesting concept. We all know we're moving towards more and more energy efficient buildings, which means yes, less use of gas and electricity and Enbridge understands and is part of that uh, whole initiative. So thank you for that. Rob, uh, with me today is Rob Johnson from uh, uh, Building Knowledge and, and myself. Rob, you've been doing uh, air tightness testing of uh, single family buildings for years now, as have I. And most recently, you've you've uh, sort of delved into and sort of got a, a, a toehold in this large building. And I'll ask you in just a few slides how that's going. But what we wanted to do is present to you the, I guess, say the differences between small building testing and large building testing over the next hour or so. And then we have 
time for questions. So we'll just uh, move towards that as, as we move along. In terms of what we wanted to chat about today, and some of you will go, well, isn't this the same as small building testing? Um, and But there are some intricacies that we'll chat about. So the why and how of large building air tightness testing, obviously we still wanna make a connection to uh, building science. And I really the key today is where is the industry at this point of time and where is it heading? That's that's what's going to be most valuable for you is to kind of check in and see where we're at on this. Specifically, I'm speaking to architects and engineers who have maybe projects on the go that are maybe two, three years out. You kind of need to get a sense of where this industry is, is headed, where it's now and, and where it's headed. Um, and some of the codes and standards uh, surrounding that is, is going to be important to you. So, you know, what is large building air tightness testing? Well, it's very similar to what you see on the left-hand side. That is the single family. There's been what we, we as a company have done 60,000 uh, single family houses. There's been over a million houses tested in Canada, probably close to 2 million now. Uh, millions of houses in the United States. It's a code requirement to test single family homes in the US in 30, 32 states, I think it is right now, 28 to 32 states. We only place we have that requirement is in British Columbia right now. Of course, I'm a big advocate of testing all houses. We're seeing the Greener Homes Program, which will again try to test another million houses. But the question becomes, what about the uh, multifamily or uh, commercial buildings? And there you see on the right-hand side, we're basically uh, putting in the same kind of equipment, but you'll notice three, three fans in one building. In fact, Rob, you will say, and you're gonna to describe to us the largest number of fans that you've used in a, in a particular building. And we're going to use the same sort of technology, the same sort of impetus to test large buildings for air leakage. What we're lacking at the moment, we have this now database of a couple million houses in existing in, um, in single family. Now what we need to do is build a database in large buildings because there's relatively few buildings. I think that last time I looked, there's only, well, less than uh, less than a thousand in all of North America, uh, I, I believe. Somebody may correct me on that one, but certainly less than a couple of hundred in Canada that have been tested over the years. So we need to get some history, some database. And it's really for two things. It's a method of calculating or measuring air leakage or air tightness in and out of the building under controlled conditions. And it's very similar to what we've done in single family. We're gonna to try to use it for two reasons. We're gonna use it to validate or the, the performance of your building enclosure. I think that's valuable in itself. And second, we're gonna to try to use it for energy modeling to determine or give you a sense of what the implement implications might be with respect to energy efficiency. And we, we can start to think about the types of buildings. Clearly, you know, residential high-rise or multifamily buildings is, is a good target that we want to think about. But what about schools and government buildings? These kinds of, um, I would say, higher demand buildings and buildings that uh, are, are uh, satisfying the needs of uh, occupants on a, on a regular basis. And then thinking about commercial and industrial buildings. The one on the right is a Hardy Davidson outlet, a, a service shop. And so what, what are we able to do with those kinds of places? So lots and lots of different types of buildings that, that we wanna to work towards. And in fact, Rob, I'll ask you to tie in at this point. You've, as I said, been, you invested in the equipment on our behalf uh, a number of years ago. How long has it been, Rob, since you actually invested in the, let's call it the um, integration technology of how to, how to work multiple orders? How, how long has that been now? Well, um, back in a, I think it was around 2014, 2015. There, we, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Oh. I can, can you hear, hear you, Rob. Can I not okay. hear you? Yes, I can hear you, Rob. Yeah. Okay, okay. Good. thank you. So, yeah, it was probably over the years we've done um, some where we put single doors in and added them up and, and just manually did tests on larger buildings. Uh, it was around 2014, 2015, we started, we took a course uh, through Energy Conservatory in Minneapolis, uh, where they actually put a bit of a, a system together and were marketing it. So we took the course at that time. Um, and it was a couple years later, um, 2018 or so, we, we did, uh, after marketing, we bought the equipment. Uh, we started marketing and we did uh, our first uh, three buildings in 2018. In 2018. So we did a 100 story, 100 unit condo building in Oakville. Uh, we did a net zero building Mohawk at Mohawk College, and we did an existing building for pre-renovation testing at Fanshawe College that year. So it's, it, it's taken some time. Um, to date, we're at, uh, 
we've done about uh, 15 tests on different buildings, varying everything from single fans to up to nine fans at once so far. Um, and we have about, um, I'd say around 30 proposals out, um, 10 on the books uh, for, uh, for testing to be done. And those are all for projects up to four years out. Isn't that interesting? And that's really what I want to give folks is the timelines. If you're thinking, am I too early? Am I too late on this? You're right at the start of this industry. And certainly uh, out in BC, they have a little more experience down the West Coast of uh, Seattle and so on. They've been doing more buildings. There may be somebody from BC who can offer up um, some experience there. But we're sort of at the start of this. There's been work done by various groups, government groups and so on over the last 20 years ago. I've seen uh, work that's as, as uh, long ago as 25 years on multifamily buildings, uh, a primarily government uh, sponsored research, not really private industry. Now we're working towards more and more private industry partnerships to get us there. And one of the things we wanted to say to you, it's, it sounds like a bit of a commercial, but generally speaking, we're, we're just trying to promote the industry and we've got the equipment uh, and we're willing to partner with anybody out there to help get more buildings done and let's share the results. We're more than interested in sharing the results as, as much as clients will allow us so that we all gain a bit of a history or database of, uh, of these kinds of buildings. And uh, when we talk about air leakage, I, I do wanna go back to, thanks for that Rob, by the way. Um, I, I do wanna go back to the history of this and remind ourselves that air leakage is really a building durability issue. That is when air tightness made its way, started to make its way into codes, which was 1985 National Building Code, started to talk about air leakage. It was really clearly stated that the reason we don't want air leakage in buildings, it's actually air leakage to the outside, warm, moist air getting into cold cavities, cavities that are getting colder and colder all the time because we are insulating them more and more. So as much as this is a energy initiative, it made its way into the code and still the single biggest reason an architect, an engineer should be, I'll use that word, should be specifying air tightness control, air leakage control, is to stop the advance of warm, moist air getting into cold cavities. And this is Lauren Rickards from RDH, that, you know, this is his statement of, of rationale that, that he's used. I and mean, then it's backed up in code is where we need to get to. And so in various jurisdictions in North American codes, we're starting to see the mandating and of, of air leakage or air leakage control. And it's in code prescriptive ways, we would say that testing helps validate that indeed you built it that way. I'll show you that in just a little bit. The ASHRAE requirements uh, or the part five requirements in the National Building Code or in the Interior Building Code do talk about prescriptive levels of air sealing or air tightness. And all we're doing is validating that performance when we do air tightness testing of those buildings. And so a little bit of our history, I would say, I was asked and cooperated with uh, Intermodal Engineering at the time back in 2003 to 2006 with Tridel out of Toronto who did work on primarily on ventilation. They were thinking about ventilation strategies. As part of that though, they wanted to characterize the air leakage of individual suites and of whole buildings. And I, I, this was sponsored, co-sponsored by uh, Canamore Housing. And a couple of things that were found. One, the suites are tighter than expected, which is a good thing. And that has partly to do with the way Toronto builds high rise, or at least Tridel at the time was building high rise, which was uh, concrete demising walls, which are inherently airtight. So the sweet air tightness, compartmentalization, if you want to call it, was tighter than you might think. Um, and then they also found that exhaust appliances don't really move the amount of air they were designed to move. And engineers, mechanical engineers on this call probably recognize that. Things like booster fans on dryers, for example, to make sure you're getting proper airflow. Uh, better bathroom fans that are now available that have higher static capabilities and consistent static capabilities. But they found the exhaust equipment wasn't working that well. And they also found there was because, partly because the suites are tighter than expected, there was significant uh, pressure variations in buildings due to mechanical, primarily due to mechanical, although stack effect and so on. So they un the suites undergo these rather uh, extraordinary, significant pressure variations from, you know, uh, from plus 75 pascals to minus 75 pascal 
depression, which is interesting. The, the most important finding of that study, at least in the context of the study related to ventilation, is about 40% of the makeup air that was going into hallways or the ventilation that was going to hallways never actually made its way to the suites. It was uh, entirely wasted. So that prompted changes to ventilation, not necessarily codes, but ventilation common practice in Toronto, in Vancouver, we're now seeing in-suite, separate in-suite ventilation systems to get rid of that wasted hallway air, if you will. And still we had problems with odors and um, uh, uh, complaints and sound complaints between suites. So lo lots and lots of things started around that era. This uh, same sort of study has been validated by RDH did a study out west not just a couple of years ago that looked at pretty similar uh, results, if you will. So, um, and we know in those buildings, because we're doing multifamily, there is much higher expectations from occupants. You know, you would think about multifamily buildings, high rise buildings used to be, uh, apartment buildings used to be, I would say, for lower income folks. And now this is some of the most expensive real estate that you find, certainly on a per square foot basis. And of course, the expectations of those clients for better control over their indoor environment is, is really powerful. So pretty useful. Uh, just to highlight again, suites are actually pretty tight, but they undergo significant pressure uh, variations. And as much as 40% of the air of uh, uh, ventilation air is wasted through air leakage in the building is where we want to get to. And then again, RDH, uh, this study that they did showing the relative value of ventilation. It just happens to be the still the most significant portion of the energy bill uh, or one of the most significant portion of the energy bill and at least something that you can attack and get at. So it is an energy consumption issue. Remind yourself again, air leakage, air tightness in the code is primarily associated with durability but also there's an energy component that we would like to think about as we move through this. In terms of that durability issue, it really comes down to the, the factor of, and most of you have seen this slide before, the amount of water vapor that is on the left-hand side for since at least 1970, we've had vapor barrier requirements in buildings to stop the movement of warm water vapor into walls. And what we learned in the 70s and 80s is, wow, you thought vapor diffusion through drywall was important. In fact, air leakage was a much bigger driver of water vapor, as much as a 90 to 100 times more water vapor goes through holes in the drywall rather than through the drywall itself. Not vapor diffusion, but vapor movement associated with air leakage. So air leakage ends up being your single biggest risk point from the uh, drive of moisture, of water vapor into walls, if you will. So important to understand. Um, and then thinking about the a myriad of occupant thermal and acoustical comfort, uh, this slide just showing the various forces that are on the building, a left hand top thinking about wind effects, uh, air leaking in versus air leaking out and imagining people say well couldn't we control this with ventilation well in multifamily buildings the people on the left would be breathing fresh air the people on the right would be breathing the left hand people's air and is that going to work and on the right hand side of the top stack effect people at the bottom of the building are breathing fresh air people in the penthouse suite are breathing everybody else's air so all of, obviously these things aren't particularly acceptable, these kinds of issues. And then we have mechanical effects. And of course, the amount of air that moves in and out on any given day, of course, changes. That is on the top right again, think about stack effect in the winter, but that stack effect essentially disappears in the summertime. So what worked in the summer might not work in the winter. Those are the kinds of things that we need to think about. And so we start thinking about do we try to manage the pressure in the building, all those myriad of pressures, or do we try to uh, stop or manage the pathways of how air is moving and those pollutants are moving? So optimizing the overall performance of the building and what we've always determined or always found is it's really difficult to manage the pressures and it gets easier to manage the pressures when you have a tighter or controlled building enclosure, whether that's the entire enclosure or whether that's just individual suites. So the strategy is, we would say to engineers and architects and builders, is manage the holes and the pathways rather than trying to manage 
the pressures from an indoor air quality perspective, durability perspective, and ultimately energy efficiency. And I just want to give you kind of orders of magnitude of those pressures. When you think about wind pressures, windows, many of you will know, are tested at minimum 320 pascals of pressure. And you go, is that realistic? And the answer is absolutely it's realistic. We can see in downtown uh, uh, wind, channel, wind uh, ch uh, channels and so on in downtown urban centers, the amount of or the, the, the pressure that might be on the side of a building on any given day could be easily over 300 pascals. And the stack effect, perhaps one of the most surprising is in the order of, can be in the order of 100, 120 pascals. And even the mechanical effects of buildings because of the pressures, hallway pressures, range hoods, uh, dryers and so on in small suites can be in that order of plus to, uh, plus to minus 75 pascals. So, really strong pressures that we need to think about, pressures that far exceed what we might see in a single family residence in commercial buildings, high rise buildings specifically, we start to see these kinds of pressures and all of these interacting in different ways on different days. So we have to keep that in mind. I, I just like showing this picture because it shows the, uh, the that stack effect. Can you see the neutral pressure plane and the point at which air leaks in versus leaks out? This is a old warehouse building that's being turned into lofts of some description. They're gonna put an elevator shaft on the outside. In the short term, they've got Tyvek on the building and notice that air is leaking in at the bottom and leaking out at the top. And again, if you were renting out or selling the penthouse suite for a couple million bucks, are they gonna be happy to know that all of the air that's in the parking garage and in the bottom suites ends up in their suite is that the ventilation or the air that they want to see? And our goal, this challenge, the strategy is trying, rather than trying to manage that pressure, is to reduce that neutral pressure plane to actually air seals. Think about starting at the top of the building. If you're only going to air seal one location, you'd start at the top and you work your way down to drive down that neutral pressure plane to reduce the stack pressures on that building and ultimately uh, wind and so on. So eliminating those pressures is, is really where we'd like to get to. And I thought you'd be interested, you will know this, of course, that the stack effect, the taller the building, by definition, the greater the effect. And the colder the building, the greater the effect. Okay, so city of Vancouver doesn't have nearly the stack effect that, say, Ottawa or Montreal or uh, Edmonton might have if we can hit, uh, and the territories on this call. So the stack effect is entirely associated with the height of the building and with the temperature of that building. And in fact, there's math, easy math. I just did this this afternoon. It's a pretty simple lookup. What is the temperature difference between inside and outside, say on a design winter day? What's the height of your building? In this case, I just did it a height per story, three meters. And if you do that, a typical design winter day in Ontario is in the order of four to five pascals. It's actually six in Ottawa and it's four in Windsor, for example, per story of building is what we need to imagine. So if you think about a 10 story building in Ottawa, that could be in the order of 60 pascals of pressure. That's imagine for energy raters on this call, energy advisors imagine, boy, my blower door test has done at 50 pascals. How annoying would it be if that kind of pressure was acting on say the sweet door of, of a of the top built at top of the building, all that air rushing in to the door. And you can imagine that's why there's a whole industry of macrame snakes and rabbits that they shove under the doors of, of suites, right? I see them all the time in multifamily apartment buildings, old buildings, new buildings, where people are annoyed with that draft coming through their door. That's on the upper levels, if you will. They feel that draft coming in. And so th these this is a, a, a practical understanding of course homeowners get that understanding and they recognize gee i need it in the winter i can remove it in the summer it's not a big deal in the summer so that change of pressure is also of interest to engineers on this call imagine um, uh, managing or designing for 60 pascals of hallway pressurization in the winter and then in the summer what do i do because now i'm over pressurizing those particular hallways so how do i manage that without managing the air leakage and managing those stack pressures is interesting. So of course we have in code this idea, it's been in code since at least 1990, this idea of stopping air leaks by using air barriers. Uh, I happen to know the National Building Code, you look at the historical perspective, air barrier requirements made their way in the National Building Code. A little bit of a mention in 85, a very specific section 
in, in, uh, in the 1990 version of the code is the first time we specifically said there should be air barriers in buildings to stop that, to stop that flow. And the key here is it's a combination of materials, materials that are resistant to the flow of air. And the key words within the code is the continuity. And I'm just showing a pretty standard parapet detail. So what is my air barrier? Is it the uh, uh, building paper on the other side of the house wrap? In this case, it might be Tyvek. Is it the roof liner? Is it drywall? Is it the gypsum sheathing? What exactly is the air barrier? And the answer is it could be any of those materials. The roof material itself could be, the, the TPO could be a good air barrier, but is it connected to the air barrier that's on the wall? If you're using drywall, interior drywall or poly as your air barrier, how do I connect those elements? So it's about the developing the continuity. I, I use this slide specifically because I, I recall in 2000, hmm, I might get the date wrong, 2012, I think it was, I was taking some training and on the training on air, air tightness of large buildings. And I was speaking with the chief engineer of the Army Corps of, uh, of Engineers in the United States. They had just mandated a year previously the requirement to test all of their buildings. And I said, how, how is that going? He said, you know, it's pretty interesting. If the architect draws the red dotted line on the page, the air barrier, and details it, we almost always pass. If the architect does not draw the red dotted line on the page, we seldom pass and we really struggle. So architects on this call, engineers, let's be detailing what exactly is the air barrier and let's give us some details as to how I'm going to make it continuous. It is really powerful. Within the uh, OBC, now Ontario Building Code is very similar to the National Building Code in part five, this is the 2017 code. Notice that it, they talk about air barrier materials and they actually give those materials properties. So you have to use a property, uh, a material that has a property of not greater than 0 0.02 liters per second per meter squared of material. That's So what passes that? Well, drywall, frankly, it's actually benchmarked that drywall. And at building materials identified as part of the air barrier have to be at least as airtight, if you will, as a sheet of drywall. What qualifies? Well, six mil poly, uh, foam products qualify, OSB qualifies, um, even products, some, some house wraps, some, some uh, uh, weather res water resistant barriers qualify. For example, Tyvek qualifies. There are fluid applied products that, that qualify. And the key though to the phrase, uh, to this slide is the near the bottom line, that phrase three that says the air barrier shall be continuous. And I would just like to put a little bit of, I guess, angst in your, in your mind. What exactly does the word continuous mean? And if you were a building owner or more importantly, a lawyer for a building owner, and you said the word continuous, exactly how many holes would they think that meant? So we have to be conscious of the fact that the expectation is you're already building tight buildings because these requirements are there. And so when you think about it, I, I guess uh, to my mind, a more clear manifestation of that is ASHRAE 90.1, the 2010 version said shall be, uh, shall be continuous, designed and constructed so as to be continuous. And they gave you the terminology around that at, at the air ceiling points, the lap joints, the ceilings of penetrations and so on. So these are kinds of uh, the kinds of elements that you would see in ASHRAE 90.1, for example. And it, the key here was designed to be. So that's clearly on the architect or engineer's page, the building envelope consultant, for example, to say. So there's not necessarily a requirement for it to be executed that way, but at least it needs to be detailed in that, in that perspective. And when it comes right down to it, you end up with kind of three different air tightness testing standards. You have a material standard, as I said, kind of that drywall standard, the 0 0.02 liters per second at 75 pascals for a material. Then you also have assembly standards, the ASTM standard 2357 or E60, 1677 that talks about taking an assembly. So manufacturers, fluid applied manufacturers, for example, will build two wall sections. You'll notice it here has a window, has a door, has some penetrations. They ship it off to a lab and say, does this entire assembly meet the air tightness requirements? And in this case, notice it's an order of magnitude up. That is the material is 0 0.02. The assembly test is point two. It gives you a hint that we don't expect the entire building to be as tight as the individual material. What we're looking for is um, the assembly, in fact, to be this eight foot section to be. And then of course that transcends to the whole building. Should we test the whole building? And in terms of whole building, the order of magnitude, if you look, for example, at the, um, 
the Toronto Green Standard target is 1.25 liters per second. Not quite another order of magnitude, but almost another order of magnitude up. So we have a material standard, and 10 times that is the assembly standard, and about eight times that, six to eight times that, would be the building standard. No, no requirement for an individual material, sorry, for the material standard to apply to the whole building. But you get a sense of where this is headed. Pretty easy for an architect or building envelope consultant to specify an air bearing material, a, a in fact, a, a series of air bearing materials. Mm, could I then ask the manufacturer of that material to show me how their assembly goes together, what are compatible tapes, caulks, so on and so on, sealing methods. But ultimately what I'd like to do is get the whole building down to a specific level of, of air tightness. So that's where we're headed. So it, it, that's the standards, if you will. So let's talk about air tightness testing. Then Rob will ask you to pop in on some of this to give your experience of uh, when we get to guarded testing and so on, just so you're ready. But thinking about the various tests that, that are done. And the first test that we've had most experience with started in that 2003 to 2006, really prompted to a large extent by LEED, was the compartmentalization of suites. Not necessarily the whole building, but at least making sure, and that's a term that's now ubiquitous across North America, it was a new term at the time, but it's there for smoke control, it's there for odor control, for comfort, maybe for energy efficiency. It was really drawn into, as an example, the lead requirements for environmental tobacco smoke control so that uh, we don't have neighbors smelling smoke from next door. I, I had a call just last week from a large developer of uh, multifamily buildings in Toronto who said, uh, now that um, and it's not just cigarette smoke, and now that we've allowed uh, the recreational use of marijuana, people are smelling next door and they're more worried about it than they were about cigarette smoke. So how do I manage that? And the idea here is that you, of course, try to seal all exterior wall and penetrations, but you also would seal all the common walls, the penetrations between suites and suite uh, uh, penetrations to the corridors, if you will. So in other words, just make a really tight enclosure. There's two advantages to that, of course, is one, that you're actually stopping the odors, the noise directly, but two, you're also giving the opportunity for pressurization of that suite. Uh, the, the higher it is, the easier it is to pressurize it or maintain a pressure across that suite. So what are we gonna do about smokers in this building is we're going to go to the two suites, those who are smoking, those who aren't, figure out the relative air tightness, what are the pathways, try to seal them as best as possible, and then maybe create a negative pressure in the smoker suite, for example, or a positive pressure in the non-smoker suite to make sure the air is going the right way. But I actually need two elements, right? I need to stop the pathways and add the pressure. The smaller the pathways, the less I need to create that pressure. So pretty uh, useful. And for example, the lead target requirement is this metric of 0.23 CFM 50, so at 50 pascals per square foot of enclosure. So I take the size of the, the compartment and I turn it into a, a metric for that. Um, Rob, was there a question there? No, we're okay. Fair enough. I thought hey, I saw on. your face come up. I thought there might be a question. Uh, Gordon, so, Scott, wait, yeah, I was just gonna. I saw a couple of questions in the uh, the chat. One I think that was applicable to what yes, you're. Go ahead. Doing. So it says, uh, "Can you let us know what is the difference between an air barrier, a vapor barrier, and an air vapor barrier?" <laughs> well, that is a good question, and and so let's take the the classic product, the uh, poly. Poly, uh, polyethylene, six mil polyethylene is clearly, well, I shouldn't say clearly, if you test it, it's well below that 0 0.02 liters per second. It qualifies as an air barrier. If you tested it against water vapor, you would find that it's also water vapor type. That is, it's not particularly permeable, hardly that's any water vapor. Let's take drywall though. Drywall is airtight, it meets that metric, 0.02 but drywall is not vapor type. Water vapor would move through drywall. And you can use materials that are air bearers and vapor bearers combined, or you could separate out those two and you would say, no, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use drywall as my air bearer and I'm gonna put up a different vapor. I might paint that drywall with a vapor retardant paint. Or if you're working on the outside of the building, you might say, well, I'm gonna use a water resistant barrier, a Tyvek or a Dorkin product that is airtight, but vapor permeable, allows water vapor to escape. So two different metrics, some materials qualify as both, some materials would say, nope, they're separate purpose. And in this context, we would say 
and air bears, even from a vapor movement perspective, air bears are about 90 to 100 times more important than vapor bears. If you're trying to stop vapor movement, the first thing you do is make it airtight. And then secondarily, you might say, ah, oh, and I also need to stop water vapor. But you have more choices for air barriers than you do for vapor barriers. That is, there's a lot of building materials that are airtight, drywall, water resistant bears, and so on, that are airtight, but not necessarily vapor permeable. So you can use them on inside, outside, you have more flexibility. Thank you for that, Scott. Was there another question? Uh, yeah, there is one other one. It was a little more specific I saw in there. It was, uh, who is the developer and owner of a condo in Oakville who asked for air tightness testing? Rob might know that. That was from Rosemary Martin. Uh, it was great golf. And isn't that interesting, right? Great Rolf, a, a great, I'll say a technical builder, a builder that's always looking uh, at what's coming next. And I, I'm gonna say, Rob, will put words in your mouth, but their premise was, we know this is gonna be code someday. Here's a building where the, based on the occupancy, how it's gonna be occupied, it ha happened to be from a process perspective, a building that was going to be amenable to testing. And that's why they took it on. Not because they had to, because they were trying to learn as to what this would look like four or five years from now. And that's a challenge I'd put out to everybody here. Start looking for a building now, because you'd hate to be surprised five years from now and go, geez, I had no idea. So look for buildings now that you'd like to test as, as part of this to get a sense of where, where you could be successful or how successful you are, are now. So that's a, that's a great one. Scott, unless there's another question, I'll move on. May I ask one more? Uh, Rob yeah, and I yeah. were in a building just recently and it had to do with common wall ceiling. Uh, and, and I've noticed this in many buildings, Gord, that you don't, that, that hallway wall, that common wall going out to the hallway, I don't see a lot of um, effort going in to seal that wall. Maybe your thoughts on that, on how to seal it, should, how well it should be sealed, that sort of thing, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely, Scott. And Scott, I should mention Scott's on the call. He's helped sponsor. Scott's with Aero Barrier Technology that uh, helps make your air barrier assemblies continuous, if you will. So I said to you, Toronto tends to do a little better with air tightness and multifamily because they use a lot of concrete demising walls. And so that's between suites. It's part of the structure of the building and concrete, poured concrete itself is airtight. But when it becomes to the common walls between say the hallways and the suites, more typically those are a drywall assembly or a framed wall of some assembly, typically a, a, a steel stud. And so now what's my air bear? Well, it's the drywall. And builders initially said to me, well, we're doing fire and smoke control and we putty around all of the others. So it's gotta be really airtight. And the answer is it's not as airtight as we, as you might think. And so drywall is an excellent air barrier, but it would mean top of wall, bottom of wall, all the penetrations, I would need to make that continuous between say the bottom wall, let's go to the bottom wall, the steel stud uh, framing on the floor, I'd have to caulk that steel stud, then I'd have to caulk the steel stud to the, the steel channel to the drywall, and similarly at the top. And you might go, geez, we don't do that now, right? That's why it's not particularly airtight. Or is there another technology? And Scott, you'll have a chance here in a bit, talk about are there other technologies because it's not a big leakage spot per se, but it's lots of running feet, if you will. You think about that hallway, 60 feet long, 60 linear feet of two sides of that hallway uh, at, down the center top and bottom. It, it's a lot of uh, linear feet of a relatively small crack, but they're not as tight as we thought they were, even though you are often doing developers, architects, engineers. And this is what I would say, go ahead and test a building or two. Tridel did it, Minto did it, to get a sense of just how tight we are. And if you're doing lead buildings, this compartmentalization testing is, is can, be, can be very powerful uh, for you. And then when we talk about maintaining then the pressure, we know that a five pascals is a really nice pressure. It, it tends to stop the odors uh, from, uh, it, it moves the odors away, if you will, or it stops those odors and to a large extent noise coming in. So five pascal pressure is a pretty interesting. It's pretty light pressure. It's easy to maintain five pascals as long as the building or the uh, enclosure is, is relatively airtight. And then Rob, I, I was gonna ask you then to describe guarded testing, just to give you a little chance here. The thought here gang is, boy, if I gotta wait for the entire building to be built and they've already occupied bottom floors or a large commercial building, they're on the, the, the left-hand wing is already done and they're still finishing up the right-hand wing and I'm anxious to get a blower door test done to see how we're doing, that could make it difficult. Rob, there is this um, idea that we could do guarded testing parts of the building at a time. Could you just take a stab at that? 
Yes, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a technique where you actually just eliminate walls with pressure. So you eliminate attached surfaces by keep maintaining the same pressure on both sides. We've done it over the years with uh, townhomes to see what the leakage is between townhomes. We've done it with, with um, uh, row housing to, to be able to eliminate so we could test just one house and determine how much was leaking between the inside and the outside and the other units beside by, by actually pressurizing the, the attached walls to the same pressure. Um, in a townhouse, in as, as an example, you would, um, if you eliminate the, the walls to the sides, to the, the adjacent units, you're really only pre uh, measuring the leakage from the inside to the outside. So you can test with and without the side units pressurized to determine what the leakage is between. That's where it started. Now we're in into uh, high rise buildings with, with multiple floors that are actually too large to put too many fans in or there isn't even the access to put the amount of fans in that you need to pressurize the whole building and test it as, as one as one zone. Um, we are working with uh, actually testing floors. So we'll actually take two or three floors, uh, put an air pressure on those floors for testing, but actually pressurize the floors above and below, below the attached surfaces to the same pressure. So we're only testing the interior to exterior on the floors we want to test. Thanks, Robin. Still has some logistical issues. The nice part is the new blower door technologies, both by Minneapolis and Retrotech, have uh, control elements that can help you with this, right? That you can set it up so you don't need, uh, well, as few operators as possible, but to maintain those pressures. Have I got that correct? Yes, there's uh, lots of techniques we can use with the electronics and the meters to actually make it fairly simple. So you could start to imagine architects, engineers on this job, let's say you're doing a 30 story building, you're anxious, got to get that. I'd like to see how we're doing. You could say, do the first two floors, maybe the first three or four floors. Maybe it's the, the common elements down on the bottom and then a couple of floors of, uh, of suites and say, hey, I'm good up to the third floor. If I continue to use the same air sealing practices on the rest of the building, I feel pretty good about uh, getting where I need to get to in terms of the whole building. The key here is that we're trying to build a database, some experience with this. So if anybody, as we get results, as an industry, I'm going to challenge all of us. Let's be sharing results as much as possible. How did you make out uh, on, on this guarded testing? Because ultimately, we need some, I, I would say, some confidence that the guarded number ends up being similar or at least transferable or translate uh, is uh, relative to the final building test. So we're trying to build this database as an industry. And that's one of the reasons Enbridge is sponsoring this session is to say, hey, let's all work together on this. It's not about individual firms at this point. There's just not enough experience. So the more data we can get as a group, as, a, as an industry, to help builders and architects understand that, hey, if I can get the first three floors to a good level, that means you're going to do a nice job on the entire building. So guarded testing is making its way. It's an acceptable path for many standards at the moment, because we know it, otherwise there's logistical issues to waiting till the building's finished. So nice thought there. Uh, any final comments on that, Rob, before I move on? We're okay, good, yes. thank you. And then, so then we wanted to say to you, and you, we've kind of alluded to it already, that there are various standards bodies out there and you'll recognize ASTM and ISO and the National Standards Body of Canada, the Air Barrier Association, a number of folks have created uh, test standards and you're gonna go, really, do we need more than one test standard? And the answer is sure, we probably do. There's really good similarities between them all and Rob, I'll ask you to comment on that in the moment. Which one do you think is the most practical from a process perspective, but each of them have, you'll notice the familiarity. There won't be a test on this, Stephanie, right? We're not gonna do a poll or a test on this, but just have a sense of the number of numbers, the number of standards that could be involved. So architects, engineers, be careful about what you specify. Let's start with uh, the, the Canadian uh, government, Government of Canada. There is a CGSB standard. It's sort of a historical standard, one, uh, uh, 149. Uh, and it was updated in uh, 2019, determination of building envelope, the tightness of building envelopes by fan depressurization method. It was updated to include a couple of new elements that allow single point, multi-point testing, two-point testing, and it does mention the ability to do guarded testing. So it has some flexi flexibility built into it, different pressures that you can use. So it's fairly flexible standard, recently update, 
typically referenced in certainly um, uh, programs that are run by the federal government, uh, the Energuide program, the R2000 program, the Net Zero programs, uh, all reference the B149 standard. Then there is an ISO standard, uh, 9972, uh, and this is really a thermal performance of building, but, uh, a determination, but it talks about the air permeability uh, of uh, building enclosures, and it's still using the fan depressurization or pressurization method in this case, and it specifies the apparatus, uh, apparatus the procedures, uh, the expression of the results. So these are all comprehensive standards that, that you could work towards. The ASTM standard, this is kind of the historical equivalent of the 149 standard, the Canadian 149. This is the 779 standard. Again, a fan depressurization used in um, single family down in the US and also used in commercial multifamily buildings. Um, it's it's a, a intended to quantify the air tightness of that building envelope again. Again, it specifies the accuracy of equipment. It gives kind of limited information on using other methods. So it's typically saying you got to use a calibrated blower door. Uh, other standards would say there's other ways of doing that testing. So uh, of interest. And then there's a 1827 standard, ASTM 1827. So this, this now gives you more flexibility, single point or two point determination. Some of these standards would allow you to use, say, the makeup air unit on the building or an exhaust fan on the building itself to create the pressure. Rather than using a calibrated device, you can use an existing uh, air moving device within the building. So ASTM 1827, then 3158. Why do we need a second ASTM? Uh, again, little subtle uh, variations in how these are used. This may be the one that's actually using the fan pressures of, of an existing piece of equipment within the building. Uh, this one is the one that was uh, adapted from the Air Barrier Association. So the Air Barrier Association uh, uh, created a standard and ASTM took that or the folks took it and changed it into a, 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 an actual ASTM standard. So I feel this one's got some legs to it as, as it moves along. And uh, Rob, did you have any sense, which of those would you say is most commonly used? Maybe it's too early to tell, but which of those have you used? Let's start with that. Um, we've used the ISO, the ASTM, uh, the new one from the, from the Air Bear Association standard. Um, it, it, it's, it's, seems to be most architects would, are specifying uh, ASTM standards. Um, sometimes if it's a European architect, they would be uh, specifying the ISO standard, kind of comes from where their background is. Yep. Um, and new is the CGSB standard in large. I'm not seeing it spec in large uh, proposals at this time yet. I think it will eventually. Do you see much difference in terms of your process? Is there significant difference in setup or cost, for example, depending on the different standards used? No, it really comes down to what within that standard is specified. Um, right. So if they're specifying a envelope enclosure test or a operational test, um, that's where your, your labor would change with the setup. Thank you. And we'll describe that in just a moment as to, as to what that might mean. Sorry, I'm just losing my earpiece here. Um, and then, so then you take those test standards and say, well, who's asking for that? Are there any programs? Are there any codes that uh, already require these? And there's various programs. Some would recognize the top left, the Energy Star program in single family requires air tightness testing, the FIAS program, the US Passive House program, the uh, Green Building Standard, the LEED Green Building Standard uh, also uh, asks for, at least recommends, or at least I uh, say encourages testing. Um, the International Energy Code, as I mentioned earlier, requires blow door testing of single family. Army Corps of Engineers has always required, not always, but historically has Ask for blow door testing. That is, they started blow door testing sooner than than others. So there are various programs out there. I'll mention a couple. I had the date right. It was 2012. So for almost 10 years now, the Army Corps of Engineers has required blow door testing of every building. That is, dormitories, uh, uh, airplane hangars, any building built by the U.S. Army Corps has had a blow door test done since 2012, uh, with a very specific uh, requirement uh, for that. The FIAS program, the Passive House program, both uh, German, Canadian, and US programs, this happens to be the US program, also require blower door testing uh, of buildings. So that, that's uh, for the architects and engineers working in those programs, that's pretty powerful. The Toronto Green Building Standard mentions and requires in a tier two building, for those of you who are in the 
Toronto district, Toronto area, and, you, and you're building to the Toronto Green Building Standard, once, if you are applying under tier two, you have to conduct a blower door test, um, but it that's a requirement in, um, uh, as of now, but there's really no test requirement. That is, uh, there's no benchmark. You just have to test the buildings and report the results. I, I was very pleased Lisa King brought this in, I would say under her tutelage. And this is nice because this will help us build a database before we get into particulars of did I pass or fail? Let's just get a database of how we're doing. And then ultimately under tier three and tier four, you're going to be required blower door testing any particular metric because you're going to be following a net zero ready uh, or net zero pass those program as you get to those various tiers. And then people will say, well, what does the national building code say? And the national building code says, well, I have a air leakage control element. Remember I said part five of the building code talks about continuous, but there's no requirement for testing of buildings, at least not yet. Of course, we feel that needs to come in at some point. What there is, is there is a credit given, that is you're allowed to apply a credit. If you can show lower air leakage, you can use that to credit against in the um, National Energy Code, you can use that against say wall insulation or against window uh, performance. So you could use the air tightness credit. You have to meet a very specific requirement, 0.25, that is that's the metric as their benchmark. You'd have to be better than this metric. You may actually want to jot it down. 0.25 liters per second per meter squared at five pascals. Oh, just five pascals. How would I measure that? We are measuring at 70, 50 to 75 pascals. How do I determine the five pascal limit? That happens to coincide more or less with 1.5 liters per second per meter squared um, at, at, at uh, 75 pascals. And here's what we found. RDH did a study of a, a number of buildings and found that's a pretty aggressive number. So here's the problem, gang. You're given, if you build, uh, build tight and if you measure and test the building, you can go ahead and use the credit. The problem is the credit is already assuming you're building the building darn tight. Hmm. I, I would look at it the other way. If I was writing the National Building Code, I would say, can you please give us a standard that's a little easier to meet? That would encourage me to do some blower door testing. I'd hate to do a test find out that I had to meet a metric that is much tighter than I currently build. And that's what RDH has basically been saying is the, the, the target is a little too aggressive at this point for builders to want to take advantage of it. Now, if you're doing passive house construction, passive building construction, you go, I got this. I, I absolutely can use this because it's significantly tighter than this element. So keep that one in mind. The Energy Star Multifamily, relatively new program uh, instituted by uh, Enerquality here in, uh, in Ontario. Um, it is showing uh, a encouraging of uh, large uh, whole building air tightness testing, but not a requirement at this point. Uh, they imagine in uh, subsequent versions that there would be requirement. There is sweet compartmentalization in multifamily of air tightness testing, similar to the LEED standard. So at the moment, though, uh, we're just at, I keep losing my earpiece. So Stephanie, give me a wave if I'm missing something. I don't know what's going on there. My apologies. Oops. So, so far, you sound okay. We do have a few questions, though, if you're yeah, uh, go ahead. When, when you're ready. Oh, okay. No, go Perfect. Ahead. Uh, well, one was more of a statement. Uh, so while you're talking about these different uh, standards, um, the ASTM E779 and the USACE is required in BC uh, via the energy step code. Someone oh, had thank uh, you for that. indicated. Um, so one question that came in was, um, if you're planning to upgrade windows and doors in a MERB, how would you develop an appropriate sampling strategy for air tightness testing for pre and post work? Um, and so they give a couple of uh, scenarios, like the number of units to test versus all units in the building as a percent, or uh, the number of units to test per floor versus uh, total number of floors. Um, so yep. that was uh, that particular question. Yeah. I always look for somebody else to tell me what to do. And so what I would say <laughs> is, you know, the lead program has said 10% of the first 100 suites and 5% thereafter. So that there's a number you could hang your hat on and say, hey, that's what lead suggests. So I, I like that number. I think that's a, a reasonable number. Uh, you might get into it and go, yeah, I'm not seeing consistency in results. If you're seeing some consistency, then you would say, let's continue on. But if you're seeing huge differences, then you would say, hmm, maybe I want to do more than that. Another question, thank you, Gord. Another question that came in was, um, every project is different, but what are the key considerations for compartmentalization on MERB retrofits? 
Um, that's a pretty broad question. Um, I, would, I would get that. Here's what we know from even from single family. It's amazingly difficult to make uh, existing buildings more airtight without major deconstruction. And I would say the US learned years ago, the, the best weatherization programs were out of the Midwest, Wisconsin, Minnesota, the Dakotas, always required blower door to directed air sealing. The idea that I'm gonna do a blower door, walk away, have some contractors do some air sealing, then come back and retest. Heck, we did that in Elliott Lake years and years ago. It didn't work very well. They tried it in the US, it didn't work. What did work was whether every air sealing contractor was given a blower door or bought a blower door and did work that, and they were, work was validated. You can say, well, the, that's like the fox watching the hen house, but, but still it was better to have the blower door there and actually give them a metric. The number I remember in Wisconsin was wherever you start, you, need, you can't turn the blower door off, you can't stop sealing until you're 25% lower. And those contractors got amazingly effective at being able to find that 25% reduction in short order because they became very experienced. And you start to learn what in that particular building, what it is that's leaking. I, I remember doing 48 townhouses and learned really, really quickly after doing like three suites in, in half the suites, it was two different um, floor plans out of 48 suites. Half the suites, the floor plan was such that there was this bulkhead above the bathroom on the second floor that had no drywall. And you could immediately get about a 30% reduction just by putting going up in the attic, pulling back the insulation and putting a sheet of plywood or foam or drywall over top of that location. And that was all that those suites really needed. The other suites were already relatively airtight. So a blower door direct, my single biggest advice would be blower door directed air tightness work. Um, Scott, you'll be able to say the aero barrier process, that's the magic of it. It air seals and does the blower door test at the same time. And I'll, I'll give you a chance to speak on that in, in just a little bit, but that would be my advice. Um, great, thank you, Gord. Um, one last question before we move on. So why is CMHC not requiring blower door tests on buildings being partially funded by them under the national housing strategy? And also um, they're not giving credit to builders for improving air tightness over industry averages. Yeah, and thank you for that. Let's put that in the chat and let's make it a statement of everybody here. I'll ask everybody to sign it and send it to CMHC to say you should, because Rob, you and I aren't going to argue that one at all. It seems it seemed like a done deal. I, again, my view is this. We at least need to build a database. I'm almost less worried about what the number is. Just let's get some testing done. So everybody on this call, find a building that's relatively easy. I'm going to say we're going to partner with you. We're going to do it as cost effectively as we can, let's look for multiple funding partners to help with this, to build the database. Cause then we could say it's worth it or it's not worth it. But clearly CMHC with their long, long history, you would think they'd be interested in this one, especially when they're uh, funding. And the key, I would say the issue we have when you say um, it, they're not giving credit. The problem is that the national building code and more, more accurate, the national energy code um, assumes buildings are already airtight. And, and why do they assume they're airtight? Because ASHRAE already assumes buildings are airtight. And that's the second or third last slide that I have to give a sense of that. So that too needs to change so that we don't assume that buildings are as tight as, as we think they are at the moment. So thank you for that one, Stephanie. And then across North America, the, the West Coast, they mentioned uh, E779 standard applied. Why? Because British Columbia and Washington State are requiring testing on the left-hand side there of buildings. So they've started to work out what's the right process, the right protocol. The Ontario Climate Action Change said they were going to do it, but that's on hold until the National Building Code decision is, is finalized. We're seeing some testing requirements in United Kingdom. So it's coming. I'm, I'm going to give you this sense. It's not, it's not the, um, we're, we're, we're not in the early days of this but we are just nicely getting started. So that's what everybody needs to take away. It's close, it's three, four years away. There are projects on your drawing boards right now, architects and engineers that may indeed be required to do blower door testing by the time they take, uh, take flight. So just keep that in mind, we're, we're getting close. And then just to recap that whole element of, you know, lower operating costs, uh, lower HVAC equipment costs, because if you knew 
that the air leakage of the building was significantly less than what you're assuming now, engineers, we know we can reduce corridor makeup air. That came out of that lead testing in 2003 to 2005. They, they started to realize if I compartmentalized the suites, I could cut corridor ventilation by about two thirds, if not more, because I could pressurize those hallways much quicker, much, easy, uh, much more easily. So keep that in mind as we move through these, these elements. Um, and then uh, the alignment, of course, with green building standards and, and so on. There's lots of benefits to air tightness. And then, uh, Rob, I was going to ask you to speak to a, a few of the examples that, that we've done. I just want you guys to be aware that we, we're mobilized. We can, we can test uh, about 70,000 CFM of air. We've got uh, lots of blower doors, lots of uh, folks who can run those blower doors on weekends, on evenings, whatever you need. So we have that ability. But, Rob, if uh, one of the questions that came up was, you know, how do I prepare that building? You kind of mentioned the difference between an enclosure versus an as-built. One of the first things to understand is once you've got the equipment set up, and this is you setting up the equipment, just speak to this one, and then we'll talk about building preparation. Yes. Um, sorry, I lost my screen there. Um, yeah, yeah the, the, the pictures there were, that was a setup of uh, Mohawk College in Hamilton. Uh, so it was, it's interesting lessons learned as you move along. Um, that one, we, we estimated we would need uh, nine fans. We set up nine fans and it turns out we wasted our time and we needed three. So, but we set up a main communication center. We uh, determine what, do a quick test, see what, what equipment we need, set it up, uh, measure leakages around the building, make sure we're not pressurizing. We have a single zone within 10% and uh, do the test. So there's a couple, just to break down a couple of those elements, um, you said thought you needed nine doors or might need as many as nine. You took the surface area of the building, you calculated based on whatever the target was, and or perhaps you're assuming how leaky the building is, and now you can figure out, you can equate that to a CFM or a liters per second and decide how many doors you need. If the building ends up being tighter than that, you realize, boy, I can get to 75 pascals with far less doors, make the whole day go a little easier. What if you underestimate it? Well, could I add more doors later or do I test at something other than that 75 Pascal? So that's an element. Just take a second though and describe when you said, make sure you have a single zone uh, or sorry, uh, common pressure across the building. Just describe that just a little bit more. <clears throat> well, when you're, when you're plan making your plans for how you're going to test, um, you wanna look for uh, air paths around the building and make sure that you're, that, that when you open doors between areas that the, the area of opening between each individual area of a building um, is large enough that it's the air moving through there is not creating too much of a pressure differential. Ah, so that all you. the areas of the building are at the same roughly negative pressure within 10%. Right, so for example, if you put in nine blower doors, nine times 6,000 CFM, that's over 50,000 CFM. You don't want 50,000 CFM coming through one man door uh, down the corridor. You'd want to open up the space between uh, multiple man doors. It, that's kind of what the, you're looking for. Yeah, as an example, uh, a double door in a building, you couldn't put s six fans in there and expect all the air to go through one man door to get to it. Right. Thank you. Uh, nice to know. And then the big question, though, is that site preparation. What exactly, architects, engineers, are you hoping to test? Are you hoping to test how well the windows were sealed, caulked, how, weather, how well the uh, fluid applied water resistant barrier went on, the air barrier on the outside? Or are you thinking how good are the backdraft dampers in the, in the train uh, air handler on the roof? Or are you thinking about how good are the backdraft dampers uh, off the exhaust fans? So are we doing a whole building that is as operated whole building? Or are we doing an enclosure test and I think uh, architects would say, I, I don't want to be responsible for bathroom fan backdraft dampers. I just want to make sure the building enclosure is done correctly. Uh, group, uh, groups and energy programs would say, no, nah, I want to know how this building's working on a everyday level. And you can imagine the classic example of that is if I'm pressurizing the building, all the backdraft dampers are actually going to be forced open. So it's not a surprise that if you do a depressurization test, you get one number, you do a pressurization test, you're going to get another number. But Rob, typically, what are you finding? What if the testing you've done 15 buildings, has it been as operated or whole building? Or is it just enclosure testing? Um, we've done both, uh, mostly as operated. Um, 
but what we have found is, as an example, um, a condo condos, when you pressurize, you end up opening up all the bath fans. So uh, in a 50 or 100 unit condo building, that's 100 bath fans exhausting air that don't bring air in when you're depressurizing. Where in commercial buildings, the, um, the dampers, like the units shown there, tend to be motorized. So the difference between pressurized and depressurized is not nearly as much. And there's a great point. So mechanical engineers, you're specifying, let's say, an in-suite ventilation system that's built into, say, an air handler that's bringing fresh air and exhaust air, but it's still putting in a bathroom fan or a range hood. Oops, if you're going to do a whole building test, boy, you'd, better, you'd rather have uh, HRV or ERV that was exhausting your bathrooms, maybe even your kitchen with positive shutoff backdraft dampers, not from an equipment perspective, but from a whole building air tightness test perspective. So it has implications both for both the architects and the engineers. How good are the backdraft dampers? How tight are those tight fitting dampers in the rooftop equipment? So just powerful to understand that, that this is what we want to think about as we're moving through it. You can also start to imagine if I'm doing an envelope test and I've got, let's say, PTAC units or big large louvers, boy, now the implications for preparation of the building, I got to hire a lift in order to seal off openings on the outside. Rob, I don't think this was you on the lift. Um, as I recall, you don't like heights that much, but uh, this, is, this is a whole nother level of complexity. But in terms of, let's say, regular preparation, how long is it taking to prep? Let's, let's talk about that. I think you said 30-story building, uh, or maybe it was the townhouse project you did for Great Golf. Uh, not townhouse, but the multifamily building, the MERB. How long did it take to prep the building? Um, Great Golf did a lot of it for us. Uh, I would say normally that would be about a three hour prep to get the building ready for a group, of a group of people. So it's pretty common for us to come in after hours, say after a Friday, after hours, either first thing Saturday morning or after hours on Friday, get the building prepped, run the test on the morning. You know, obviously workers can't be coming in and out. So often people will ask us to do the test on weekends and that, that just becomes an inevitability, I guess, in this kind of work. So that's site preparation. There you are performing the test, Rob. Just describe down at the bottom. What are you watching on the screen? So each uh, one of those lines um, going across is a is a measuring a pressure. Either it's measuring a pressure through a fan and turning that into CFM, determining CFM, or measuring a pressure between inside of the building envelope, or measuring a pressure between zones of the building to make sure that you're you're creating a single zone. Um, so that's basically what we're what we're showing there. Um, you can see there's there's one right across at zero, and then there's a bunch at 70, which would be the building pressure, <coughs> excuse me, and the larger ones would be the fan pressure, which is converted to CFM. And Rob, you and I uh, helped uh, Intermodal and RDH do a building, I think it was still Intermodal at that time, I believe, doing 11-story building, and that was back far enough that each blower door had to be run separately. So there was five blower doors, five of us each on on uh, cell phones, turn it up five pascals, turn it down five pascals. In this case, you're controlling all of the doors from one location, just- One, one computer runs everything and records it. Right, and ma managing all of those doors together. So kind of cool, thanks uh, for doing that. And then Rob, uh, these were three buildings that you wanted to highlight. You'd said you'd done 15, but perhaps you would just highlight for us a couple of the particulars around, for example, the Sifton building out in London. Yeah, Sifton was an, is another builder building very tight buildings, but again, they're, they were checking to see if their details are correct and to work on their details over the next three or four years as codes change and they'll be expected to, to perform well all the time. Um, so this was, uh, they used an ASTM standard uh, with the US Army Corps of Engineers protocol. One thing to note is it's, 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 it does get confusing. Sometimes we're, we're asked to quote something like a standard, but they don't say what the protocol is, they're, they're two different things. One is pressure and how you're gonna set the building up. And the other one is, um, you know, how, you, how the equipment, what, what the actress, the equipment has to be and things like that. So it gets a little confusing. Um, this is just the data points off of uh, one, off one pressure test uh, we did on that building just to show you how it was. So if you look at um, the flow of liters per second that you can determine how many fans we used or how many right. fans you would need for that. Nice. Um, and then this was the city of Hamilton, a multi-agency center. It looks this, like five, six stories. 
yes, this was a building they were having issues with water intrusion. So they were, they were um, wanted an air tightness test to see if what the, the things that as, as they move along, the things they're doing are actually improving it. So this was an envelope test. We had to seal everything up. So we were testing envelope only. Um, we set up uh, nine blower doors. We needed to get this to 75 Pascals. And there's kind of our main station in the middle. One picture of one of the fans on the outside and some of the ceiling we had to do to prepare the building. So in this case, water leaks, wanting to think about enclosure uh, or envelope test only. So let's, let's tape off, seal off all the intentional openings. Let's for, look for large leakage spots that might also be indicative of water leaks, right? So That's rather right. than water testing the building, um, maybe more difficult. Let's air test the building and see if we find anything obvious. And and were they able to find anything that helped them on the water side? Uh, yes, they did. And they're, I believe they're they're in the process of doing one um, side of the building at a time with recladding. So we'll probably be back to test as they do them to see if it, the improvement after each test. So it's a continuous project. Nice. Um, and in this case, you just use the, the 149 test because it was just a, a matter of depressurization looking for those air leaks. Um, but you use the, uh, you also looked at the Army Corps of Engineers protocol as well? Yes. Yeah, we followed the Army Corps of uh, Engineers on that one. Um, right. And the ASTM. We, it, we covered them all. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we made so sure everything we covered both standards so that if it ever gets questioned that we we did it in such a way that minimum requirements were met for all standards. Thank you. And then the last little one you wanted to highlight was the uh, St. Uh, St. Mark's uh, Church Air Test. Could you just describe that for us? Yes, this was a interesting project. It's a nonprofit bought a, um, a church that's not being used anymore, and they're going to convert it into social housing. Um, so because it's nonprofit, obviously money is very tight. Um, the engineering company that's helping them with this uh, wanted a test before they start renovations and then they will do a test after renovations. That can be applied into uh, grant money they get for, for energy improvements. So it's just one of the places they can find some funding to help with the project. Right, and obviously a historic building and some interesting elements. You did some thermographic work as well to try to highlight where that air, leak, uh, air leakage might be. That's right. Um, that was part of the project and that, 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 um, it, it, it's about one in 10 projects we end up doing infrared, um, to look for leakage when we test. Nice. Thank you for that. And this was, uh, in this case, you use the FIAS test, as I recall. That was the requirement for a FIAS test on this one. Yes. In which case it'd be a both a positive pressure and a negative pressure. Right. And I was just showing one side here. Sure. Again, that was the architect who kind of laid that out, said, I, not that you're necessarily trying to get the FIAS but levels, but at least to test to those uh, standards. That's right. Good. Well, thank you for that. And then I did want to present, you know, it's uh, uh, perhaps um, uh, appropriate to talk about air sealing details. I mentioned when Stephanie asked the question, it's surprisingly difficult to take an existing building, even in major renovation, make it airtight. And when you think about air tightness standards, it's pretty easy to get the big holes and we'd always encourage you to do that. But how do we get the small holes? You know, I'm very pleased that um, we've, uh, we, we've brought the air barrier technology to Canada. This was a technology that was first developed in 94 to seal duct work. It was repurposed, but repurposed about five years ago. And I happened to be uh, working with a group down in Minnesota and they said, Gord, you got, you got to see this. This is, a, a, and I'll let Scott describe the, the process, but this idea that it would, while it's doing the blower door test, it's also sealing the building. So Scott Stevens with, is with us, who's uh, one of the partners in Air Bear. Scott, um, take us through the technology and tell me when to flip the slides. Okay, great. Thanks, Gord. I uh, I just wanted to start. It's such an important, um, obviously, issue with air tightness in buildings. It, it takes me back to what we were talking about at Builder Camp. Uh, with Elizabeth May and Peter Love and talking about the macro. And for us to, as a country to achieve our goals, we need everything we can get with every small hole that we can get. And that's you know kind of where, where aero barrier comes in. And I know there was a question uh, earlier on that kind of uh, Stephanie had passed on to me. She, we didn't answer it, but it asked about kind of how, what's the starting point? What's the best starting point for aero barrier? And as we say, and you know, we've been talking about this for decades, it's, you know, let's build it tight. Start with building it tight. Aero barrier will get up to a half an inch hole, but we don't want to get a half inch hole. What we want to get are those small uh, holes that you're talking about, those hair size follicles 
chemicals, the ones that are very difficult to, to find and the ones that cost a lot of money to try and track down. So what Aero Barrier does is we pressurize the structure and it doesn't matter what sort of structure it is. We pressurize it. You can see kind of the equipment. We use a, a, a blower door. And in some cases we use a few fans like Rob was saying as the building gets larger, but uh, like in a single family, these are all single family houses here. We'll use enough to pressurize the house. We want to get it to a hundred Pascals. Then we simply start misting in a uh, water-based sealant and the pressure as the air is escaping, it takes those small little uh, particles along and they find the holes in the exterior. And so they start crashing into the sides and then they start crashing into themselves and they eventually fill up the hole. And we see uh, reductions um, in air leakage of 60, 75, in some cases 85 and 95%. Uh, and we reduce that that air leakage. And what's nice is this can happen. I'm just going to use a single family uh, dwelling because we could be in an area in a, in a condo. You know, it could be in a couple of hours where we can get that type of improvement. So it doesn't, Aeroberry doesn't really care what the structure looks like. You know, you see, I'll go to that next slide there. There's a, uh, th there's a North York Women's Shelter there in the top, which was a 40,000 square foot uh, building that we, we, uh, we sealed up. We got called in late, but this is a building that was you know, completely wrapped in, in uh, blue skin, looked very, very tight, and they weren't able to achieve their targets. And within, you know, 48 hours from prep in, a, in this large building to, to finish and driving out of there, we managed to to achieve those targets in, in that building, all with Aero Barrier. Uh, you see just the, the different the pictures going on there. I'll go to the next slide. Maybe I'll just comment on that oh. quickly, because the first element says the owner and the architect set a really strong energy goal, maybe even some might even say an unfair energy goal to somebody who had never, a, a large uh, contractor who'd never done air tightness before. And of course, the contractor wanted to do their best and said, we got this, we got this, and ultimately found they didn't have it. They couldn't get to that level. And frankly, Scott, you might have said, bring us in earlier. Like if you just, if you had, because they spent weeks trying to do this and you might say, hey, we're, you get the building down as tight as you can, two, two and a half, something like that. And then we'll take it down lower, I think is the, is the point we're trying to make here and get those small holes. But uh, speak to the next slide, absolutely. Yeah, and that's, Gore, that's exactly what we said to them. Like, get us in at the right time. And this, in a case like that, if you get in too late, there's a lot more work to be done. This product does not stick to a vertical surface, but it does dry fall to a horizontal surface. So the more finished goods, obviously the more work, uh, a little bit tougher uh, to get. So get us in at the right time. We're pressurizing the building. And at the end, as you were saying earlier, Gord, we're doing a blower door test the entire time. We're doing this in, in live, at live time. So you can see on that certificate that we have, you can see that uh, line dropping down so it shows where it starts and all the way through the process we can measure what's going on and what the, the tightness is and at the end we have a, a, a pressurized you know sealing certificate nice and just uh, back to that point of so you, the ideal time is before finished goods are starting to come in before cabinets and flooring is that the is that the case that's right yeah we want to get it after first mud is dry is a perfect time to get it Right. It's when we Thank can we, we can drive our most efficiency from through all the stages from prep to to finish. And Scott, I'll suggest that there may be questions at the end, and we'll just given timing, we'll just finish up our presentation. If people want to ask you questions about air barrier after, that would be fine. I wanted to make one final point. I mentioned this is near the end of the presentation. Of we've been focusing today on air tightness. That is the measurement, some sort of measurement element. It's typically a metric of a normalized leakage rate of, you know, CFM per square foot or, and that could be at 50 pascals or 75 pascals. And a typical target is that, you know, two, two liters per second at 75 pascals. From an energy modeling perspective, you'd like to know not how airtight the building is at some given pressure. You'd like to know how much is it leaking on any given day, in which case you kind of have to choose a, a normal operating pressure. And what is used in air leakage modeling in ASHRAE 90.1 is actually five Pascals. And I would say to you, and that's an average pressure. So they basically take the entire square footage of the building and assume it's leaking at a pressure of five Pascals and how much air is coming through that material. And we would say, is that really appropriate in high rise buildings? Do they take into account stack effect, wind effect, and so on? And this is that NECB, the National Energy Code target, which happens to be a pretty tight target. It's assuming the buildings are already pretty darn tight. And why? Because it's assuming this relatively low leakage 
at our relatively low pressure, this five Pascals. So we feel like there needs to be work done. I don't want this to, um, anybody on the call to be discouraged by this. What I want us to be accepting of, and those are in government agencies and so on, is to be open to the idea that in fact, maybe we do need to set a higher initial target, something that's looser, if you will. So it encourages engineers, architects to say, I would like to do some blower door testing, I don't know if my buildings are this tight. That's a pretty tight standard. Let's do energy modeling at something a little higher and then get some credit for actually making it tighter. And then five years from now, maybe this is the appropriate target. So it's just a little pitch that I want to give you for those who are doing energy modeling. You're not taking blower door test results. You're taking the ASHRAE number at five Pascals, an assumed number of air leakage of materials. We're doing an air tightness test and the two don't necessarily jive. So we have to kind of have two different things going on. And in architects, if you're designing a building, energy modeling is different than that's air leakage. And we're talking about air tightness testing in this case. So that's kind of where we're at. There are lots of, there's lots of good information, RDH, um, and, and frankly, lots of great stuff out of BC, a wonderful guide that you'll see that illustrated guide to achieving air tightness uh, written out in, in BC by BC Housing, very powerful study. So lots of resources available to you. And Stephanie, we could provide those as we move through this. So as we were, as we finish up, I would just say air tightness has lots of advantages. One, it gives us really good control of moisture, of noise, of odors, of energy, and of ventilation. It actually allows your ventilation system to work much better. It also, we recognize the compartmentalization is really powerful because it starts to reduce stack pressures that you have to work against. Um, and I'm going to say to you, it's not common now, but it will be common. I'm going to challenge you all to look for buildings to do as we try to improve standards. There's enough standards out there now, but let's improve the understanding of how those standards are involved and looking for those consistent protocols. And Rob, I think you're already at the point where you could help folks determine what is the right protocol to use. So there, and then lastly, this, these game-changing technologies that are available both fluid applied on the outside of the building and aero barrier technology that working towards. And so I would say be conscious of air tightness testing versus energy modeling, but basically, not a basically, but let's, let's get started at this. Let's start looking for buildings. I'll challenge you all, A, to start looking for buildings, or B, if you are testing buildings, let's share the results as we move through this. And so I'll, I'll leave it there and ask Stephanie if there are any questions. Let's make sure I get my earpiece back in. Don't know why I'm struggling with that one today. Uh, go ahead, Steph, any questions? Um, there's no questions, but there are a couple of comments. And so I'll read those here. And so the first one was um, regarding operational tests that are unsealed. Often hard to meet. Uh, so they said the first point was they're finding that it's often hard to meet correlation coefficient requirements since gravity dampers slowly open up at higher positive pressures. Nice. And the second uh, point they made was under operating pressures, gravity dampers are usually closed. So test results overestimate leakage even uh, con when converted to five Pascals. And they go on to say that they convert uh, tested results into five Pascal equivalents for the modeling. Uh, yes, and that is possible to do. So we, we do need to know that you, you, you can, so make some assumptions, you're extrapolating the line, basically you're taking a, an air leak, a, air tightness at 75 Pascals, you're using a, what's called the flow coefficient and you're extrapolating that down to five Pascals and you're assuming there's a consistency that is all the holes leak at a consistent rate or at least at a declining rate down to that five Pascals. And, but they make an excellent point that the dampers are kind of a bit of a wild card as to what happens to them at lower pressures, then they start to close and that changed the characteristics of the building. So we're not finished on all of this, that's the point. We have pretty good protocols for air tightness. We have a pretty defined energy modeling, uh, but how do they cor correspond? And we're making some choices, some algorithms. It's physics, it's not necessarily real, or let's, let's say it's an estimation or interpolation, extrapolation of results. It doesn't necessarily play out in, in actual, but it's the best we have right now with these mm -hmm. series of algorithms. So those are all the comments and questions that we have. Um, so uh, I want to thank you, Gord and Rob and Scott for your presentation. And of course, uh, thank you to Enbridge for, for sponsoring. Did, Gord, did you wanna have any final closing remarks before I sign us all off? 
I always have something final to say. Thank you. I know. <laughs> I just set you up. <laughs> I, I will just say again, thank you to Enbridge as a great partner in the industry. And, you know, that's why we love working with them. And that's why we like partnering with others in the industry. The comments we got, we, you know, whoever that was, we'd be more than happy to share what we have. Um, if you're willing to discuss, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Uh, we would say to you, we have equipment here. Uh, we're interested in helping architects, engineers. If you need to mobilize doors, we can help you mobilize equipment and expertise. Rob, you now have some really good experience at, at 15 buildings, some of the ins and outs. Just go through one more time. You do a pre-site, a, a, a pre-meeting, right? The day before you do the testing, well advance the testing. Just describe that very briefly. Yeah, we usually uh, try and visit the meeting uh, a little bit before we would be there to test but for several reasons. We want to make sure the building is ready and we don't spend a lot of time mobilizing a lot of equipment and people for, for no reason. Um, we also want to make sure that everything is, is there, um, that there's electricity, that we have access, that we bring enough extension cords. Do we need ladders? What kind of tape do we need to seal? Come up with a sealing plan and what, what equipment you would need to do that. So when you get on site, you can be as efficient as possible and work through the process. And But it is kind of cool, kind of fun to do these tests. I know our guys are always pleased to help you out. We don't seem to lack for volunteers when we look to do weekend work. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it's it's worked very well. Um, the guys come out, uh, they enjoy working. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's fun work. It's a nice change for our guys that are doing uh, residential blower door tests day in and day out and, and inspections on the different programs. Um, yeah. It, it's uh, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time just uh, helping others. Um, I was just on a call with so, uh, somebody from Newfoundland a few weeks ago, helping them put their first proposal together for a, a large building test. Um, so we're willing to help the industry and uh, and be a big part of it. Thanks. And the guys in BC obviously doing great work out there, RDH and others. So uh, thank you all. And again, so two two things to take away. One. Let's all together build a database. Let's share results. And two, architects, designers, engineers out there, start looking for buildings and clients who might be interested in getting a test done, even if it's a simple guarded test, because you are going to want to know how well your buildings are doing before it becomes mandated. And it's not a question of if, it's going to be a question of when. They're already doing it on the left coast. You know it's going to spread to the rest of the country, and it should because it's a durability issue and it's a resiliency issue. And it's an energy issue. And those three things are on our agendas these days, right? And all the buildings that you built. So let's work together to build this industry and anything we can do to help, we'd love to do that. Steph, as always, thanks for your time setting this one up. And, um, and um, I know Enbridge will be pleased that there was a good reaction to the session. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so thank you, Rob, Gord, and Scott, and Enbridge. And um, so what'll happen is once I close out the session, a little, screen will pop up and I'll have the survey monkey link if you would uh, please uh, in input that information into there that would be very helpful for us and um, I will also send out a link to the recording and also the slide deck uh, at a later time probably tomorrow okay so I hope you guys have a, a great day and uh, our next session is in August I, I will also include a link for our next uh, our next webinar and that is on basements. Andy will be joining us for that one. So thank you everybody and hope you have a great, great afternoon. Bye.